Hello, I'm Stephen Hollybart. Welcome to The Truth About Life. If you like today's show, there are more like it, and new ones coming along every few days, go to my YouTube channel, Stephen Martin, that's Stephen with a PH, Martin, and have a look. I think you'll want to subscribe. Today we'll be talking with Kevin Todeski, Executive Director of Edgar Casey's Association for Research and Enlightenment. Edgar Casey, also known as the Sleeping Prophet, gave more than 14,000 readings, many having to do with the nature of reality and why we're here on Earth. In a nutshell, Kevin, what is the true nature of reality according to Edgar Casey? Well, in a nutshell, I, I, what I call the Casey cosmology is essentially that uh, we are here in the Earth to, to essentially bring spirit into the third dimension. I mean, it's not that somehow we just came into the earth and our job is to get back to heaven. Uh, instead, from the Casey perspective, our job is to bring the spirituality uh, of God into the earth and transform it in the process, growing and expanding ourselves. So uh, Casey often pointed out that uh, Jesus was really the uh, embodiment of what every soul's destiny was. Uh, not that he, every soul needed to become a Christian, because Jesus wasn't a Christian, he was Jewish, but instead that every soul needed to perfectly manifest the uh, divinity of the God in the earth, which is what Jesus did, and that is our destiny. So the purpose of uh, life, is, there is a purpose to life, and it is to become like Jesus, to become, to serve? What to, is to, to become like Jesus, to somehow... Uh, become aware of, of yourself and manifest what Casey called the Christ consciousness in the earth in service toward other people, to really become all that uh, you have as potential within your being, uh, and become aware of your relationship to God and to all others during that process. And Casey was a very devout Christian, as I understand it. He read the Bible once for every year he was alive. He did. He, he, the, Casey himself, Casey the man, was definitely Christian. He was an elder here in uh, his church. He taught Sunday school all his life. The Casey readings are much more ecumenical in their approach. They uh, uh, look at God from every religious perspective and suggest that God really ultimately doesn't care what religion we are, that what's important is how well we manifest whatever awareness we possess in service and love towards our fellow human beings. Did Casey have uh, any personal problems with, uh, with the reincarnation element to, to what he was uh, coming through him in the readings and, and Christianity, of course, which has, doesn't have that as part of the uh, canon of the church? Did, did that cause him a problem? Well, I mean, it, it definitely dis depends on how you want to approach this question. If you read his biography, there is a river. There's certainly the suggestion that it was a major uh, challenge in the beginning. However, uh, in the process of reading the Bible once through every year of his life, there were certain passages that had never made sense to Mr. Casey. And w during one reading after the topic of reincarnation came up, uh, the suggestion given to himself during the reading was to read the Bible from cover to cover with the idea of reincarnation in mind. And in doing that, Casey actually found closure to questions that hadn't previously made sense. And he also got the picture of a God who was uh, all loving, uh, forever fair, and completely uh, enabling his creation to become all that he or she was meant to be. I mean, essentially from the re reading's perspective, if we're all given the same goal, which is to, if you say, let's get to heaven or uh, understand our relationship to God, if we all have the same goal, then it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense that we don't all have the same test. I mean, some of us have very challenging lives, very challenging personal problems. Uh, a child who per perhaps was born uh, in the Middle East in poverty uh, to is, uh, an Islamic family would have a very different life than a child born in the United States to uh, Billy Graham, for example, and why would those two children have the very same goal? From Casey's perspective, everything that happens to us is there for a purposeful reason, drawing to us the lessons we need in order for our own personal soul growth and transformation, and ultimately, we're all going to make it. In Casey's cosmology, every soul makes it. It makes sense to me, and, and the reincarnation certainly does too. And, and I've read the, at least the New Testament and seen passages in there that seem to indicate that uh, Jesus and his followers believed 
or took reincarnation for granted, really. Well, and certainly I hear lots of times people say, well, how come reincarnation isn't in the Bible? It is in the Bible. It's all through the Bible. In Matthew alone, I, I've found 11 references to it. It's just that we don't necessarily understand what is being stated. Uh, if you're looking for the word reincarnation, it's not in there, but neither is the word Essenes. We definitely know there was a Jewish sect at the time of Jesus called Essenes. They're not mentioned in the Bible, but it doesn't mean they don't exist. It's just that uh, there's definitely laws and, and ideas and concepts in the readings, and even a statement from Jesus himself that uh, Elijah had reincarnated as John the Baptist, suggesting that definitely Jesus and the apostles were familiar with the laws governing reincarnation. Yeah. What about um, karma? What, what, what is karma? Well, again, it's, it's a matter of terminology. Karma is uh, bandied about by lots of groups and individuals that may differ somewhat from what Casey believed it entailed. From Casey's perspective, karma is only memory. It's not destiny. Uh, and basically, we don't have karma with other people. We only have karma within our own selves. We have a karmic memory or relationship with that person inside ourselves. So another way of looking at it is if you had an experience with someone in the past, your karmic memory of that experience and that person might be very different than the other person's. You might have some kind of grudge that they totally are unaware of. So each of our own karmic memories are our own, and basically what we're dealing with is we're dealing with the memory inside ourselves trying to transform it. So from Casey's perspective, the karmic memory is there not as a chain about us or some kind of thing we have to deal with uh, until we draw our last breath. Instead, the purpose of karma ultimately is to enable us to gain a new level of awareness, transforming whatever went wrong the last time around and choosing something differently so that we grow and enlighten ourselves in the process. So the idea that uh, two people have some sort of karmic thing to work out, that's, that's not? That's not exactly correct. It may definitely be true that, let's say, for example, my wife and I had been together previously and we had issues and challenges that we're dealing with in the present. Absolutely, each of us has karmic memory with the other person, and absolutely, the universe has brought us back together again to, let's say, save time and energy and bring the same people back together to try to deal with the issue. But ultimately, the karma is my own. I am only responsible for my own transformation and personal enlightenment. I cannot take charge or responsibility for what someone else is willing to learn. So what is the key to releasing this karma? Is it forgiveness, or what, what, how do you? Often it entails forgiveness. It, most often it, it entails a different level of awareness. Uh, let, me, let me tell a quick story of how this often comes up. Uh, we have conf conferences year-round. We have people that come from conferences from all over the world. Uh, I've been involved with ARE for 30 years. Uh, over the years, uh, a lot of people have come to my office, and generally a, a woman will tell this kind of a story. She'll say something like, you know, I grew up in a very verbally abusive household. My father always criticized me. Time passed, and eventually I got married, and lo and behold, after the honeymoon, my husband was always pointing out what a crummy wife I was. I had children, then I wasn't a good mother. My children got old enough to speak, and then they talked back to me and say they wish that they didn't have me for a mother. Eventually, I went back to the workplace. Now my boss is always pointing me out as someone who doesn't do anything right. She'll say, I guess this is my karma. Well, the karma is not so much to be a, a, a scapegoat or to be downtrodden by everyone else. Instead, the karmic memory is this woman apparently has such a low opinion of herself that she keeps drawing to herself people who have the very same opinion. So the awareness change that needs to occur is this person needs to realize, my God, I am a good person. I can do things. I don't have to put up with this. And as soon as she changes her mind and her level of awareness, her karmic memory changes and the experiences stop. So the karma is not to keep going through the experience over and over and over again until you can't take it anymore. The karma is to change your awareness so that why you're having the experience becomes purposeful rather than just something you're put, being, having to put up with. So we, we keep coming back re being reincarnated until we overcome this karma. What do we eventually have to do to move on to whatever the next level is? is and let me answer that in two ways. One, somebody asked Edgar Casey that one time, and his first response was, I get there and find out. <laughs> the, uh, the, the second response is, I'm convinced that ultimately nobody moves beyond this curriculum until everybody has made it. Uh, in Buddhism, there's a sense of a bodhisattva vow that uh, you will take a vow when you reach 
to spiritual perfection that you will return until all sentient, sentient beings make it as well. So I think that although the personality self may say, you know, life is so challenging, I can't put up with these hardships. When I make it, I'm done. I'm going to get out of the earth. That's it. But the soul individuality, which is very much aware of uh, our connection to God and ultimately that we're all connected to God, and so until we all make it, we're not done with this curriculum, I think the individuality would say, you know, that really wasn't so bad. I'm going to go back and help. And there's actually instances in the Edgar Casey material where somebody was told they had actually made it, which I'll talk about in just a minute, and had decided to come back anyway. And from Casey's perspective, making it in the earth is really about learning uh, unconditional love. And then if you can learn unconditional love for every single human being, you actually learn the ultimate lesson the earth has to teach. You don't necessarily reach perfection in the earth. You can go on to other uh, levels of awareness to do that. But if you can learn unconditional love from Casey's perspective, you've passed the earth's curriculum. This is Stephen Hawley Martin, and I'm speaking with Kevin Todeschi, Executive Director of the Association of Research and Enlightenment, about the truth of man's existence as revealed by the psychic readings of the world's most documented psychic, Edgar Cayce. We're speaking about karma and what we need to do to stop reincarnating and move on to higher levels of reality. Kevin, when we return to Earth for another incarnation, isn't it possible to actually regress in our development? Absolutely. You can so you're taking a chance? There are, there are experiences in, in Casey's readings where he talked to people who had made it and then regressed. They made mistakes again and kind of went a step back. Well, wasn't that true of Casey himself? And in, in Casey's own past life readings suggested that he had actually made it to a very high level of awareness and then eventually messed up uh, during the time of colonial America as an individual named John Bainbridge who possessed a very uh, unique psychic ability and used his psychic ability for gambling, for example, and to uh, uh, just get whatever he wanted. And for that reason, in Casey's own readings, he suggested that that's why he had to go to sleep every time he gave reading this time, to set himself aside. Hmm. So in a sense, uh, and I actually talk about this in my book, Edgar Casey on the Akashic Records, which deals with Casey's highest source of information, that the universe is, is cognizant of the fact that we can mess up. And for that reason, uh, there are certain universal laws in place that will only enable us to mess up so badly. In other words, if I do everything perfectly in a lifetime, the next time around I will have more parameters of freedom of choice. But if I start to mess up, the next time around my freedom of choice will be limited because the universe will only let me get into so much trouble. Uh, and so our freedom of choice in any given life kind of grows and, and decreases depending on the choices we've made. Hmm, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. You mentioned personality and individuality. Those are two different things, according to Casey's. Right. And, I mean, again, you have to define the term. I think the, ultimately the personality self would be uh, perhaps how the world views you or how the face you put on for the rest of the world, whereas the individuality self would be who you really are deep inside, that spark of divinity that, that has been connected to God since the very beginning. Uh, no facades, no agendas, no biases, that, that holy self, higher self, some people might call it. But that holy self, that higher self, that individuality can grow, can't it? Can't it uh, do the incarnations, uh, does that individuality progress through those incarnations or does it stay the same always? Well, you could have a long debate on this question. I, I think that from my perspective, if you imagine your hand is the sole individuality, then in any given incarnation a finger might be a personality so that whatever personality self you're aware of, there's much more to who you are ultimately. And in that process of uh, life's experiences and uh, getting a sliver here or there or hammering your finger with a hammer, uh, there's an impact on the personality self that definitely affects the individuality, that we definitely grow and expand and learn by the lessons that we're having uh, in any given incarnation. So I think the, the truth is a growing thing. I, I also think that somehow God's awareness is constantly evolving as well. 
Well, that brings up a point. Is uh, Casey referred often to God as uh, the creative forces? Is God in in this concept uh, more like a, a Brahmin or a force, or is it a, is God a personal God? I mean, but, and the Casey's actually asked, answered that question to several people. The answer is both: that he's a, he, he or she is a very personal, loving, parental figure, a personal God as well as the creative force that imbues everything that exists. Uh, science right now is doing a lot of work with uh, uh, physics and vibrations and looking at the ultimate building blocks of creation. And from Casey's perspective, everything is made up of the same stuff. That stuff he called vibrations, you might call it uh, atomic particles. But he suggested that everything is made up of parts of the creative forces, parts of God. So ultimately, everything is God. Uh, but we are in the process of becoming aware of our own individual spark of the Creator. And our goal is to get back to God? Or? Our goal is to get back to an awareness of our connection to God. I mean, a, an analogy might be is if, if we have a child, let's say, and that child shows some uh, uh, affinity for music with maybe a learning pad, a musical keyboard, uh, that child has to work at it, maybe go to lessons, maybe uh, practice voice, let's say. Uh, ultimately, that sole potential child, let's say, has the ability to be a concert pianist or maybe a singer or a musician, and that all along has been a part of the sole potential. But it still has to go through lessons and uh, curriculum in order for it to become a part of the awareness. And I think that's very close to what happens to us as a soul, that ultimately we all have the potential to become a Christ but we have to have the experiences and choose to learn from those experiences in order to get there. And one of the things Casey uh, said through his readings is that we, it, it helps in order to advance this, to have an ideal, or we need to have an ideal. What did he mean by that? Well, ultimately an ideal is basically a, uh, a, a spiritual rationale for why we get up in the morning, uh, what we do. Uh, the interesting connection to ideals and just learning your life is that ultimately because of our many experiences in the earth and our many uh, karmic memories with people in our lives that it's all too easy to fall into old habit patterns and uh, experiences and you can meet a person and, and essentially we pick up the relationship where exactly where we left it off and we've all had these experiences where we meet someone for the very first time and we don't like that person or we meet someone and we really like and admire them and Without working with an ideal, we're apt to just continue in that same trench or that same way of thinking. When you're working with an ideal, Casey's approach is really to set your sights on something better or higher. So that let's say if I'm impatient, then uh, somebody who's really slow and methodical is going to really push my button. From Casey's perspective, I need to really try to work with an ideal of patience so that I can understand the qualities of, of slow and meth methodical, let's say, and the qualities of being empathetic and the qualities of being present in the moment. And it's really by picking a higher ideal that we give ourselves the opportunity to move out of rote ways of doing things. Patience is a big part of what he was saying that we needed to learn, isn't that correct? It is, and it, although it's challenging to wrap your mind around, he suggested that uh, patience is one of the dimensions that uh, if you took time, space, and patience and rolled them all together, you'd have a sense of, of how our learning curriculum was created. Well, patience is something that I'm, I guess I'm here to learn this time because I'm not very patient. I, I think we all have that as a, uh, some lesson. In fact, in, in Casey's uh, 12 Lessons in Personal Spirituality, that's lesson number seven that uh, we all ultimately have to go through. What are some of the others? Well, the first one is uh, cooperation, and, and how they developed was in 1931 when uh, the Edgar Casey Hospital closed. Uh, a group of Casey's friends rallied around him, and uh, they really wanted readings on how they could become more psychic themselves. Uh, and Casey began the first reading and suggested that the goal wasn't really to become psychic. Uh, the goal was to become more spiritual, and as we became more spiritual, we would become more psychic as a byproduct. And so the first lesson was cooperation. And right away, right away we hear the word cooperation and we think, 
we know what it means and we assume we know how to cooperate or we don't. But from Casey's perspective, it's not so much cooperating with other people, but cooperating with God, that somehow we set aside our uh, beliefs of how something needs to be done or what somebody should be doing or, uh, or maybe our personal agendas, and we instead set ourselves aside and allow the Creator to speak to us or to be guided in a certain way or to look out for uh, synchronicities or to just be open to whoever the universe might send our way. Uh, and that's just cooperating with the universe, cooperating with universal forces. The next one is about know thyself. Uh, really, ultimately, uh, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. We're not physical bodies who just happen to have souls. We're spiritual beings who are in the third dimension. And so the whole lesson on know thyself is really about becoming aware of the fact that there is much more than just a physical body. There's more to us than a physical body. Third one would be ideals. What is my ideal? And they progress onwards all the way up to love. Love being the ultimate lesson. And uh, certainly from Casey's perspective, the ultimate lesson we can learn in the earth is unconditional love for all other people. And do you have a course here at the ARE, or are there books available that, that uh, lay all this out? There are quite a bit of material, whether it's the Search for God study group program. We have hundreds of groups around the world that discuss concepts like cooperation and meditation and know thyself and love in, in individual homes. We have uh, online groups through email. We have uh, books on Casey's lessons and personal transformation. So it's definitely part of the spiritual growth material that we have uh, make available to people. Uh, you've written a number of books, I believe. Do you have a new one out, or what's, what's the...? Uh, my latest book is Edgar Casey on Vibrations, which is really about uh, the fact that everything is, is in motion. Uh, even the table in front of us right here now is uh, made up of atoms, and those atoms are vibrating and uh, have a motion to them, even though they look, it looks solid. And from Casey's perspective, all these things in motion are vibrating uh, with the creative forces that set them loose in the very beginning. So everything is, in effect, is alive. Everything is alive uh, as part of the building blocks of, blocks of creation, yes. Is, is the life force uh, really what is the ground of being of physical reality, or do you get into that? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get at what, what is the, did Casey talk about the first cause? what made physical reality? Well, uh, yes, he did. Uh, I, I want to simplify the question, though, a little bit. Uh, I think from Casey's perspective, we can all understand uh, God being at higher uh, levels of spirit or awareness or uh, that somehow embodying something way beyond the physical. But what we have a harder time understanding is God being in the earth or even God being in two dimensions. And Casey's perspective is really one of our jobs is to bring God into physicality, to God into the third dimension. And we do that by service to people. We do that by smiling at a stranger on the street. We do that by giving money to somebody in need. Uh, we do that by helping whoever might be in our, in our life. Casey suggested that as long as we're alive, there is someone in our life to whom we can be of service. And even if, for example, we're in a, an assisted living facility, very often the person we ultimately could be of a service to is one of the people who's supposedly attending to us, or maybe a family member who needs a listening ear. So as long as we're in the earth and, and conscious, let's say, there's someone to whom we can be of service. And even sometimes when we're in a, a comatose state, there's a way we can be of service as a soul to someone either trying to help us or someone in our family sphere that we just can't even imagine. Hmm. Casey's uh, readings would say there are, th there are three levels of mind, aren't there? And uh, can you talk about that for a little bit? Or you, you mean the, the three conscious, oh, three part conscious, super universal conscious? He, he would suggest there's there's three levels of awareness, consciousness, uh -huh. subconscious, and superconscious. Okay, that's and, it. And so especially in terms of, th this comes into play especially in terms of dreams, it comes into play especially in terms of uh, working with psychic ability. Uh, from Casey's perspective, the conscious mind is, is very much what we're aware of right at this moment. We're talking to someone or we're watching a television program or we're reading a book, that's all part of what the conscious mind is aware of. The subconscious mind actually is much more powerful and much more uh, 
all-encompassing. The subconscious mind comes awake, is actually awake at all times, but we become aware of its content sometimes while we're dreaming or when we are having a daydream, uh, when we're meditating sometimes. From Casey's perspective, the subconscious mind is actually essentially the mini radar system of the entire being. And so one example of the, how that works is if you are at a crime scene, for example, and are hypnotized, you remember much more under hypnosis than you are aware of consciously. And that's because your subconscious mind picks up on everything. And we don't necessarily become aware of everything, otherwise we'd be on sensory overload. In fact, uh, science has suggested, this is not Edgar Casey. this is science, Science has suggested that the conscious mind actually filters out 98% of the stimulus coming to it. And although that sounds really high, uh, most people are not aware of uh, what chair or, or car seat they're sitting on right now. You don't feel the body on your shirt on your body. You don't feel your uh, shoes on your feet. You don't feel your glasses on your nose. You're not aware of the sound of the heating or air conditioning system. And all those things that you can direct your conscious to are being picked up all the time by your subconscious. And so one tool Casey uses with working with your psychic ability is you learn how to turn your awareness to what's going on subconsciously and you can pick up on all kinds of intuitive uh, things that you did you are aware of, you just didn't know you were aware of. The superconscious in some ways is similar to what uh, Carl Jung called the collective unconscious, which is somehow a, a part of our minds or awareness that is connected to all others. Uh, it's the highest state of awareness from Casey's perspective. You could, this is the level of awareness where you'll have a uh, pre precognitive dream. Uh, this is the level of awareness where you could pick up on a past life. This is where you could have a real valid uh, precognition about world events. And the interesting thing about this level of the mind, the superconscious, is we're always, always picking up on our potential future. When we sleep, the superconscious mind actually has a direct through line to the Akashic Records, and it's constantly calculating probabilities. Uh, if I do this, here's the outcome. If I do this, this is the outcome. Because the, the Akashic Records are responsible for bringing to every soul exactly what a soul needs when it needs it. I'm speaking with Kevin Tedeschi, Executive Director of the Association for Research and Enlightenment, about the truth revealed by the psychic readings of the world's most documented psychic, Edgar Casey. Tell me, Kevin, uh, how does the subconscious communicate this information? Very often, we have a dream about one of these potential futures, and we wake up the next day and we're having a conversation with somebody, or we go somewhere and we think, wait a minute, I've already had this conversation, or wait a minute, I've already been to this place. And we have an experience of deja vu, and very often what deja vu is is really fragmentary dream recall from the night before. Uh, and that's something we all do. We all pick up on potential futures from the superconscious mind in the dream state. So didn't, Kay, didn't Casey say in one of his readings, or maybe more than one, that, that nothing happens without our dreaming about it first, or something to that effect? N nothing of significance ever happens without it first being foreshadowed in a dream. What can we do? I'm one of these people that has a hard time remembering. I don't re remember dreaming half the time, or even most of the time, because I know we all dream every night. Right. What is there anything we can do? Do you know of that we can? Absolutely. Uh, one one of the things that a lot of people are not aware of is every person dreams an average of 90 minutes a night. We have about uh, this is not Edgar Casey. This is science. We have about uh, six dream periods of perhaps 15 minutes apiece, totally 90 minutes where we dream. And even if we don't work with our dreams, they can be helpful. And just one example is that we've all had the experience where we. Uh, feel anxious or overwhelmed or unhappy or depressed and we go to sleep and the next morning we wake up and we feel fine. Casey suggests that what happened is, is the mind contrasted and correlated the, the events of the day and came to some resolution. So the process of dreaming can give our mind insights into what's really going on in our life and make us feel better even if we don't remember the dream. Uh, and that's why people feel better or, or they come to more of a normal state of consciousness after a good night's sleep than they may have been when they went uh, to bed that night, the night before. But uh, just imagine how much more helpful dreams would be if you actually remembered them. So one of the things in, in our culture is we're not culturally predisposed to remembering our dreams. Most often when we grew up our parents didn't say, well hey what did you dream last night or tell me about your dream. Uh, and if we did have a dream we remembered, usually it was something maybe scary, and we were told, well, that was only your imagination, or it didn't mean anything. 
Uh, instead, what we need to start doing is encouraging young people to tell us their dreams. In our own life, we need to get a piece of paper, let's say, or a notebook, and every morning we start writing down whatever we remember. The mistake lots of people make is they lay there and they're aware of having a dream, and they try to remember the story before they start writing. And what happens is your left brain kicks in and your right brain kicks out. So the dream's gone. It's much easier, much better actually, to take your pen in hand and just start writing and re-experiencing the dream as you're writing it. I remember dreaming about yellow, or I think I saw something related to work. And just through practice, start writing down whatever comes to your awareness. Uh, and over time, you will start to remember your dreams. When I first started, I never remembered having any dreams. And after a very short period of time, I was writing for over an hour of what dreams I had. Uh, I eventually told my subconscious mind, I can't set the alarm clock an hour early just to write down dreams. You know, we need to get a Reader's Digest version here and got it more normal after that. But uh, Well, can you, can you do that? Can you sort of give your subconscious instructions about remembering? And sure. So, so what do you do before you go to bed? Before you go to bed, you can say, uh, I will remember my dreams. What I often work with, uh, I often teach people how to work with their dreams. And one of the things you can do is you can get a... Uh, a friend or a spouse, a partner, whatever. And you each think of, think of a question you'd like to have an answer to. So maybe you have a question about work or something about your health or something personal. Write out that question. Put your name at the bottom of it. Give it to your friend, your spouse, your partner, and ask them to dream on it for you. And you dream on their question. And sometimes we feel more bought into helping someone else and we're, we kind of get some performance anxiety thinking, boy, they're going to come with a dream. I better have one, too. <laughs> and we're more apt to remember sometimes by helping somebody else. That's, that's, I hadn't heard of that. That's a great idea. I have to give that a try. Um, sometimes I give myself instructions to, to come up with the answer to a question. I ask, to try to ask it in a yes or no way the night before and, and in the morning. I, I seem to have an answer, is that, uh, but I guess I need to remember the dream, too. Well, and you can, uh, you can do that, too. I mean, lots of people throughout history have done that, asked for a question or even taken a short nap in the midst of trying to solve a problem and come up with a solution. And part of it is because of, uh, the conscious mind is just a small piece of our overall uh, mind, and we open ourselves up to much higher levels of awareness in the, in the sleep or subconscious state. I see you've written a book, Kevin, on the uh, Akashic Records. What, what, what's that? Uh, well, Edgar Casey suggested that, that there was a, uh, uh, a supercomputer system that he called the Akashic Records that kept tra track of every thought, every deed, every activity that ever transpired in the earth uh, and had that soul's name written next to it and that somehow this was an etheric field, an invisible field around the Earth that just kept track of data. Uh, as unusual as that may sound, most people are probably aware of the near-death near experience where somehow you have a death experience, you have a life review, you get to see your whole life in total, and then you're brought back before you die. Basically what's happening is those people are actually having access to their own Akashic record. They're getting to see their life review from their own personal Akashic record. Uh, the Akashic Records do keep track of the past, but they also are constantly calculating probable futures, bringing to us exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. From Casey's perspective, uh, every soul has the potential to learn from everything that's brought to it. We have the possibility, because of free will, of not learning a lesson, and in which case it will be brought to us over and over again. For example, let's say we had a really hard time with an overbearing boss, and we got rid of that boss, and we were thankful to be in a new job, and we've never actually forgiven that person. And one day our daughter comes home with her quote-unquote fiancé, and lo and behold, his personality reminds us exactly of that boss. So the universe will bring us the same lesson over and over and over again until we've mastered it. Free will doesn't mean we get to choose our curriculum. It only means we get to choose when we're willing to learn it. And it's not that the universe is trying to punish us. It's that we're all working on wholeness, and some of us require very different things for our own personal wholeness. So Edgar Cayce on the Akashic Records is really about how the past influences us, how whatever is happening to us in the present is really about an exercise in growing personal awareness, and how we're constantly creating our future by our choices and thoughts and decisions today. 
You know, it reminds me of that movie Groundhog Day, which I think is really very profound because that really is a metaphor, isn't it, for, for what you're talking about? Uh, absolutely. I mean, Groundhog Day is a perfect uh, archetype for what happens to a soul until they've learned the right lesson. I mean, over and over again, you're going to have the same thing dra drawn to us until you do it perfectly, and then you can move on to the next lesson. I guess we've got a lot of lifetimes to go, most of us. But we'll be here for a very long time, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and your book, uh, Vibration, Spirit and Motion, what is the, you, you gave the thesis of that a little bit earlier, but what, what can we learn from that? I think that ultimately one of the important things uh, for me, let me tell you what I, I learned mostly about Casey on vibrations, is that even thought is a vibration. And that if we're constantly having thoughts of harm or irritation or frustration with the people in our lives, we're actually wrecking havoc with them. We're, having a negative impact on them just as much as if we went out and tried to hit them. So thoughts are things, Casey would say, and can become crimes or miracles. And the thoughts we're sending out are vibrating uh, at a certain level of frequency. And what we need to do is instead really work on uh, raising our own vibration so that the things we're creating in life and in our thoughts are worthy of being children of a God. Uh, because very often, we send out thoughts of irritation or frustration, and they have an impact. And all we need to do is, when, whenever we uh, elect an official in this country, just look what happens to the official over a period of four, eight years. Look at how they start to look aged, how they start to look worn down. Part of it is definitely the, the uh, wear and tear of the job, but part of it is also, if you have 100 million people thinking how rotten you are, just imagine what that's doing to your physical body. So even if you don't agree with someone, uh, we actually have a prayer group here where we pray for world leaders even if we wouldn't necessarily agree with those things those late leaders do. We surround them with the Creator's light and we ask that only those influences that will help that individual make the best possible decision are allowed to enter into their, their, their energy field. Didn't Casey say that, uh, or maybe it was someone else, that thoughts are things? Thoughts are things and can become crimes or miracles. That's the Is quote. Is that the whole yeah. quote? That's the whole quote. What did he mean also by uh, spirit is the life, mind is the builder, and the physical is the result? That's an oft-mentioned quote in the readings. Basically, spirit and the life suggest that ultimately there's only one source, uh, and that's spirit. And it ties in with vibrations as well. Everything is a part of God. Mind is the builder suggests that although there's only one force, that with the creative potential of the mind, we can mold that force into positive or negative uh, experiences. For example, a dynamite can be used to drill or to get energy or to mine. It could also be used to blow up someone's house. So the energy uh, can be directed into positive or negative uh, directions based on our freedom of choice. The physical as the result suggests that ultimately however we use that creative energy will have an impact on the physical. And we all know people who just in terms of themselves personally, if they're, if they're negative or unhappy or always see the glass half empty, eventually it starts to have an impact even upon their face. The frown lines, the way they appear to others, uh, it does have an impact on the physical. Conversely, if someone's always up and cheerful, a joy to be around, eventually that will have an impact as well. And not only does it have an impact in the present, it has an impact in our future life. Uh, one of my favorite stories from the readings really ties in with the Akashic Records as well, is there was a woman who came to Edgar Casey, and uh, all her life she had had a really hard time making friends. She was known as a loose woman, even though by this woman's own account it was not true. Uh, none of the girls wanted to be her friends because she had a bad reputation, and all the boys joked that everything said about her was true. And eventually she told Edgar Casey that very often growing up she felt like she had a, a red A around her neck, like the scarlet letter, because people right. just kind of stayed away from her. And Casey gave her a reading, uh, without knowing this at the time, and told her in her very last, most recent past life she had been a prostitute. And that she had, her intent, her ideal, had ultimately been selfishness. Casey said, you used what you had to get what you wanted. So in other words, she used her body to get whatever she wanted. And so we can see that energetically that was set up and people are still picking up on in the pro present even though that may not still be her line of work. But the fascinating thing about that is about three years later, another woman came to Edgar Casey, 
very loving woman. Her nickname was the Angel. Everyone wanted to be around her, uh, totally embodied love. Casey gave her a past life reading and told her that in her most recent life, she had been a prostitute. But she had used the only thing she had out of love to give companionship to lonely men. And so that one got credit for love and it was reinforced in the present. And the other one got credit for selfishness and it was reinforced in the present. So the energetic vibration with which we do something stays with us until our awareness changes. That's amazing. One last question really I wanted to um, ask and what you, re you reminded me of it. And that is the, let me preface it by saying we live in a world that seems to want to blame everybody else for our problems. You know, we're constantly suing each other. I'm reminded of the lady who spilled uh, hot coffee on herself and, and sued McDonald's for $10 million because they didn't tell her it was hot. Uh, wouldn't the Casey reading say that we're really ultimately responsible for everything that happens to us? We are ultimately responsible for everything that happens to us. And uh, we are not victims. I mean, we're very much co-creators in our life's unfoldment. And if somebody does, uh, through legal means, try to blame uh, another person or even e extract money from another person for something that ultimately is their responsibility, although in the short term it may seem like they got away with something or they got money out of it, uh, the universe has a tally sheet that is 100% accurate and ultimately they will not get away with it. And even something as easy as, let's say that somebody uh, really had a great time financially and decided, you know, I'm not going to really worry about this, I'm going just to declare bankruptcy and have all my bills paid off that even though the court system may have enabled us to declare bankruptcy, we are still responsible for every jot and tittle. And the next time around, or even this time around, we'll start working and working with wondering, well, why can't I get ahead? What, what is wrong? Why am I having such a hard time getting past this? And part of the reason is we have to pay off an old debt. And uh, although grace is a part of the equation and that we can gain the grace so that we gain the awareness of the power of money in terms of its only energy and we can't misuse it for selfish, selfish means. And if we really gain that into our awareness, we don't necessarily have to pay off every nickel. But uh, the Casey material would say that everything we do, we are responsible for and we cannot get away with anything. So the only way we can we won't get away with it. We have to learn that lesson before grace steps in and, and uh, helps us over the hump. Is that it? Well, grace will enable, if we're open to it and we have uh, the commitment to it, I think grace oftentimes will help us learn a lesson. Help us, if, if we make a little effort, grace will help us make the overall effort. Earlier we talked about a personal God versus a force. Does God step in and help us sometimes or is that what grace is? I think the Grace oftentimes is becoming aware of the presence of the God in whatever activity we're trying to be involved in, and then bringing the awareness of that presence to the situation, uh, the awareness of God into the situation, and somehow transforming it, gaining a new awareness about it, it just makes it a lot easier to deal with. Because of free will, we were able to do, quote, evil, unquote, acts, but doesn't grace somehow use those not only as lessons but whatever the best possible outcome will be will be well ultimately but it is possible to make a mess of things i mean we can we can ultimately make a mess of things the universe will have to adjust itself and and set us up for the next possible learning curriculum so it's not like the it's casey would not say that everything that happens is god's will i mean that is in a sense a cop-out but instead that everything that happens can become purposeful if we choose to make it so. Uh, the only time the universe cannot work with us is if we're stuck in indecision. So that if we keep going through the same decision over and over again and not choose anything, even if we choose wrongly, the universe can work with us by bringing to us a correction later on. But if we keep going back and forth in indecision, we're stuck and even the universe can't work with that. So decide something and forge ahead. Actually, on a number of occasions, Casey would tell somebody who was really hard, having a hard time making a choice, do something even if it's wrong. Because if we do something, uh, even make an error somehow, uh, we'll have the chance to correct it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. 
This is Stephen Hawley Martin. I'd like to thank the friendly folks at the Association for Research and Enlightenment for having me here and for generously sharing the knowledge they've gained from the many years they spent studying the Casey readings. I encourage you to find out more about the ARE and how membership in the organization can benefit you. Visit their website. That website is www.edgarcasey.org. Casey is spelled C-A-Y-C-E. That's www.edgarcasey.org.